here as well. And uh, just kind of just, just to make everybody aware of what's what's happened here. So it's taken us a while to meet. We're um, you know probably 18 months into the session um, during which we were appointed. I know you know, and part of the reason for that is it, it took a while for the appointments to happen. It took a little bit over a year for that to happen. I understand uh, the administration was doing some background checks just because of the nature of this task force. That was a more important step than it often is in uh, some task force meetings, and that ended up taking a while. So we finally got. Um, a point we finally had members of the committee sometime around February or March of this year and we were beginning the process of uh, deciding when to meet when the pandemic hit and everything at the legislature shut down so that delayed us a few additional months um, but fortunately we are between special sessions now um, we were finally able to get a meeting uh, on meeting to happen via zoom so it's it's great to have everybody here uh, Senator Ralph did you have any opening remarks you'd like to make? I'll just uh, welcome to everybody. Thank you for taking time. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, the reports and uh, I think uh, we've got a good agenda. So I probably be a good idea. Let's just dive into it. Sure, sounds good. Um, so the first item I have on the agenda here is the approval of the minutes from January 25th, 2019. As I said, it's been a while since we've met. Um, the materials were emailed around to task force members. They are also available, I know, on the Minnesota Department of Health website. Um, is there any discussion to the minutes? And if you see me looking over this way, I, I'm trying to keep track of a document showing if anyone <laughs> has asked any questions, so I apologize for that. Okay. Um, so I'll move approval of the minutes of January 25th, 2019. All those in favor, please say aye. I raise your hand also so you can see. Yeah, there you go. Opposed? Okay, the minutes are adopted. Uh, I th the next thing we'll do is uh, just, I just want to introduce uh, members of the task force who are present. So maybe if you could just say your name, uh, say where you work, what you do, and what your interest in this task force stems from, and just try to keep it fairly quick because we have a pretty full agenda. And I'll do, maybe I'll, it's probably easiest if I just call on people in the order you appear um, on my screen here. So that's that's what I'll be doing, um, and I'll just call on everybody. So if, if you're just attending out of interest or to testify to, just if you could just please identify yourself, even if you're not a member of the task force. So immediately to my right, I have Sheriff Chris Call. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, yeah, Chris Kalk, Sheriff in Isanti County. Um, I'm on the executive board for the Minnesota Sheriff's Association and the appointee by the 87 sheriffs from the state of Minnesota to participate on this uh, on this task force. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, Darren Teske. Yeah, I uh, thank you, Representative Freiberg. I am the legal and policy advisor for the Office of Medical Cannabis, and I have been assigned to staff this task force. Thank you, Mr. Teske. Uh, Bruce, you're. Yes, you know, you're I'm having an orange, sorry. Bruce Bostrom, <laughs> I am a pediatric hematologist oncologist. I work at Children's of Minnesota. And I'm happy to serve on the task force. I've been a medical cannabis provider for since it, it started in uh, pediatric patients and have published article on our use of medical cannabis in over 100 pediatric patients. Thank you. Uh, Maren Schrader, or Schroeder. Maren Schroeder. I'm sorry, Maren. That's OK. <laughs> Uh, Marin Schroeder, I'm a freelance paralegal and policy director for Sensible Change Minnesota. I'm here as a patient and I'm also a caregiver for an adult patient, my mom. Thank you for being here. Uh, Dean Gilbertson. Yes, thank you. My name is Dean Gilbertson. I'm the CEO and president of the House of Hope in Mankato and I represent substance use providers. Okay. Uh, Gwen Verchota. Hi, it's Gwen Verkota. I am um, representing graduate education at Minnesota 
state uh, colleges and universities at Mankato. However, I'm in at the Edina office. I am grad programs coordinator. I'm also a family nurse practitioner who has an interest in uh, prescribing medical cannabis, um, special interest in kids as well. Uh, I'm, my focus has been on chronic disease management. So I uh, appreciate the opportunity to join this committee. Thank you for being here. Uh, Chris Tholkus. Good afternoon. I'm Chris Thilkus. I'm with the Minnesota Department of Health, and I am the director of the Office of Medical Cannabis. Kristen Eckert. Hi, good afternoon. I am with Legislative Liaison with the Minnesota Department of Health. I am not a committee member, uh, just joining today. Great. Thank you for being here. Erin Chase. Hey there, Erin Chase. I uh, currently work in finance in a small local bank in Edina. I am here as a patient and have also done a few years of advocacy work as well in the medical cannabis space. Thank you. Charlie Reznikoff. Hey, this is Charlie Reznikoff. I'm uh, an, a general medicine doctor and an addiction medicine doctor at Hennepin Health and at the University of Minnesota. And I do a variety of pain consultations and addiction medicine. I wrote our inpatient cannabis policy and I do a lot of community education about cannabis. So I'm really excited to be here and thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Senator Melissa lopez Franson. Hi, thank you for having me. So I represent Senate District 49, which are the communities of Edina, Bloomington, Eden Prairie, Minnetonka. And I've also served as a uh, vice chair of HHS my first term. This is my uh, second term and I'm still on the Health and Human Services Committee and I also chief authored uh, the recreational cannabis legislation a year ago with uh, Representative Freiburg in the House and it was the only bill that had bipartisan support and also um, received a hearing in, in the Senate. So we did have um, a very um, first debate I suppose on, on this conversation. That's how I got involved in the issue of medical cannabis as well. Thank you. Uh, Ann Hoekstra. Hi, um, my name is Ann Huckstra. I'm a clinical pharmacist with uh, board certification in geriatric pharmacy. So I'm interested in the effects of cannabis on the geriatric population. Um, I have experience um, lecturing at St. Catharines University. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jessica Hauser. Hi, I'm Jessica Hauser. I am uh, I work in nonprofit fundraising and development for a nonprofit in Stillwater called Valley Outreach. I have been very active in um, cannabis ad advocacy, and I am the mother of a pediatric patient, Wyatt Hauser. He was actually the first one registered to participate in the program here in Minnesota. I'm very happy to be here. Thanks. Thank you for being here. Marie Dotsas. Hi there, um, I'm Marie Dotseth. I'm an assistant commissioner at the Minnesota Department of Health. I'm very happy to be with you today. Thank you for being here. Janet Ryder. Uh, good afternoon, Janet Ryder. I'm the Chisago County Attorney. I'm here as a representative from the Minnesota County Attorneys Association. Thank, Thank you. you. And Mary Kay Gilbert is the last person I have here. Hi there, thanks for having me. Good afternoon, I'm a registered nurse a uh, certified case manager and board certified patient advocate. I uh, sit on the board of directors with the American Cannabis Nurses Association, and we work on advancing excellence in cannabis nursing practice through advocacy, collaboration, education, and research. Thanks for having me aboard. Yep, thank you for being here. Um, so that concludes just the introduction of the members. The uh, next item on the agenda, we're going to turn it over to Chris Tholkus from the Office of Medical Cannabis. Uh, she's going to give a program and office update from the Office of Medical Cannabis. So, Ms. Tholkus. Let's see. I'm not sure if you're talking. Okay, there we go. Thank there you go. For this now. Uh, let's see from the beginning. Okay. So I thought that I would we would could just go over a little bit of background since we have a mix of folks who have been on the task force for some time 
and a number of new members as well, it might be a good idea to just get grounded and all understand um, what the purpose and background of the task force is. So the task force is actually part of the statutory language and requirement, it's a 23 member task force. Um, we do have one vacancy in the, um, the substance abuse category. Um, otherwise, all of the um, vacancies have been filled. Um, the task force purpose is to hold hearings to conduct an assessment that evaluates the impact of the use of medical cannabis and evaluates Minnesota's activities and other states' activities involving medical cannabis uh, and to offer analysis of program design and implementation, the impact on the healthcare provider community, patient experiences, the impact on the incidence of substance abuse, access to and quality of medical cannabis and medical cannabis products, the impact on law enforcement and prosecutions, public awareness and perception, and then any unintended consequences as well. Um, there are two reports to the legislature um, that are part of the task force. One is that the co-chairs of the task force shall submit the uh, following reports to the co-chair, to the chairs and ranking minority members of the legislative committees and divisions with jurisdiction over health and human services, <laughs> public safety, and judiciary and civil law. Uh, by February 1st of 2015 was when the first report on design and implementation of the patient registry program was due. And then every two years thereafter, a complete impact assessment report uh, is also due. Upon receipt of a cost assessment from the, a commissioner of a state agency, whoops, um, that should also be submitted. And then second, the task force may make recommendations to the legislature on whether to add or remove conditions from the list of qualifying medical conditions as well. So that was kind of the background. Um, the second thing on my list to cover is to talk a little bit about uh, COVID response. As Representative Freiberg mentioned, um, as this group, he, was, uh, he and Senator Ralph were planning to have the uh, convening of this task force, um, the pandemic hit, and that posed some challenges for our patients. Um, we had some conversations with uh, the two manufacturers in Minnesota, and uh, as well as with the patient uh, organization as well. And we put forward uh, an emergency executive order. Um, there were a couple of things that are covered. One is that patient enrollments, the way that the program is currently set up, um, patients need to re-enroll on an annual basis. Um, right now, the emergency executive order, which was the full order was emailed out to you all, um, that patient enrollments are that are scheduled to expire beginning March 31st are essentially extended until August 1st of 2020 or 60 days after the end of the peacetime emergency, whichever date is later. Uh, second provision uh, is that healthcare practitioners may certify a patient's qualifying medical condition after having an initial visit through a video conference, telephone, or other remote means. Um, and the requirements, I've got it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, other remote means. So most we were finding that most of the healthcare practitioners had moved to doing um, telemedicine essentially. And so we wanted to um, assure that our patients could still um, see their provider and that we would accept that from them. Um, two more provisions. One is that OMC patients may register emergency temporary caregivers. Um, so we, uh, many of our patients are very sick and are immunocompromised. And so we wanted to assure their safety and um, allow any patient to be able to have a caregiver that could um, go to the dispensary or the cannabis patient center and pick up medication on their behalf. Um, and then the last provision, medical cannabis manufacturers uh, are allowed to do curbside pickup. So that is another flexibility option that we are offering for patients so that they can be a little more protected by not having to go into the cannabis patient center and then also providing protection for the staff at the cannabis patient center as well. 
um, have an update for you on um, provisions that passed during the 2020 uh, legislative session. A couple of things. One is that uh, age-related macular degeneration was a condition that the state was petitioned for last year. Um, we did accept that condition. And then during the legislative session, the legislature determined that we would not be adding that as a qualifying medical condition. Um, another provision is that some clarifying language on qualifications for uh, the reduced enrollment fee was passed. And so it really just, um, there was an uh, Office of Legislative Audit report that came out last year. And um, there were some comments in that report or some findings um, that we should tighten that up. And this really aligns with um, the Office of Medical Cannabis's uh, current practice and also um, puts some additional uh, railroad disability is new and really clarifies um, both the veterans disability category as well as the SSD category. Um, another change was that the medical cannabis manufacturer is no longer required to operate a minimum number of cannabis distribution facilities, but they may operate up to eight. So there was some concern, I think, um, in the, the previous legislative session, um, they had expanded the number of cannabis patient centers that each manufacturer could have. Originally, they could each have four for a total of eight. It was expanded that they could each have eight for a total of 16. Um, and it was a shall, not a may. So they were required to have those 16 total cannabis patient centers. Um, and after the pandemic hit, uh, the manufacturers had some concerns about investments and cash flow, and they, I think, were nervous about being able to get all of their new cannabis uh, patient centers up and running in 2020. Um, so the language was changed from a shall operate to a may operate, and so this is the, the way that the provision now reads. And then lastly, the Office of Medical Cannabis um, has been doing inspections uh, at the manufacturer facilities, a variety of inspections, um, several a year. And um, that is covered in rule. And in the last legislative session, um, that was codified. And so we do have a requirement in statute now to, to do inspections. And then during the special session, um, the, oh, looks like Senator Ralph, do you have a question? No, I was going to wait until you were done. I just wanted okay. to get in the queue. Got it. Um, so, and then during special session, um, the extension, um, that executive order that we went over um, during special session, uh, a portion of that was extended. So the, the portion around allowing for um, telemedicine, so the video conference, telephone, or other remote means, that particular provision is extended through June 30th of 2021. And those are my updates. I welcome any questions. Senator Ralph. That's yeah, I guess yeah. Um, one thing, one just, thing. Just, I'm sorry, we're getting an email here. here. Uh, uh, I'm not sure why. Um, anyway, the, the, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> in looking at the executive order, it's, it's pretty evident that there's some things that we in this particular committee, and, and I think in the legislature, will want to look at as we go forward as possibly making them permanent, especially the telemedicine provisions. And I think looking at the temporary case givers, trying to get a, a little bit different or more flexible approach to that. Uh, I think those are good things that the governor uh, did and that we should as a, as a legislature be, and, and this committee I think could, could possibly have some recommendations on that uh, to actually think about some, some permanent legislation uh, to improve the, uh, the delivery of the uh, products to the, to the patients and making it more accessible. <laughs> so that's just my, just, just a thought as I go forward. Sure. Any response to that, Ms. Tholkis, or should I guess that's more of a comment, we, so maybe. We, we would welcome any discussion about provisions and um, would, would love to, to hear folks' perspectives um, and hear from patients about how the provisions are working for them. 
Great. Um, Marin Schroeder has her hand up. Yeah. Um, I have a couple of things that I wrote down uh, during Chris's presentation. Um, first, uh, piggybacking off the executive order provision as a patient and as an adult caregiver for a patient who is severely compromised with multiple comorbidities, that temporary caregiver provision and the curbside pickup need to be extended need to be extended. They're so crucial for our family in, in maintaining safety um, with myself being at risk, higher risk, and my mom being extremely high risk. Um, and then I just had a couple questions um, on the fee issue. Uh, the registration fee. One was, can we just clarify when that goes into effect? And then how are patients who transition from social security disability to social security retirement before now going to be identified in the system? Uh, Ms. Stolk, I, I, was off, I was author of the bill to do the fee, but I don't remember the effective date specifically. Was it just the default sure. August 1st, Ms. Stolk? Yeah, yeah okay. it was the default date. And then um, as far as uh, patients will need to self-identify um, when they do their annual renewal, um, they'll need to identify what category they're renewing under and then provide documentation. Um, and it does actually say they need to provide documentation. Now, it, I think it used to say something like attest to. Um, so. so if the patient was on, so this is my mom's case, so it's a good mm -hmm. example here. Uh, Social Security disability transitioned to retirement in, I think, 2017. Um, so she's now on SSR, not SSDI, um, but under this new fee provision, she should qualify for the reduced fee. So maybe mm -hmm. adding some clarification um, during the registration process, I just wanted to flag that for you. Okay. Yeah, that's great. And we'd be happy to, um, to talk to you or your mom uh, and uh, have someone from our call center who processes those applications be real specific for you about what we'd need for documentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Bo Bostrom. Yeah, hi. Uh, I uh, do telemedicine uh, for my patients with leukemia and mesoactivation <laughs> syndrome and found it that it's a very rewarding experience for me and the patient, uh, especially the patients that live a long way from uh, Children's Minnesota. They much rather stay home rather than have to drive all the way down to the big city. So I totally support uh, that we do uh, uh, ex extend the, the use of telemedicine. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Huckstra. Yeah, I have to speak to the fact that we live in Minnesota and in the geriatric population, getting around in the winter is very difficult. So I would support any extension of telehealth. And um, also just from experience working in pharmacies, the drive-through or the curbside pickup has always been a popular um, option for a lot of patients. So it does help a lot of folks who are kind of confined to the car or confined by weather. So I would be in favor of any extension of telehealth and curbside pickup. Thank you. We have a comment in the chat from Jessica Hauser as well. It says, I would support telehealth and curbside pickup being extended indefinitely. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's probably a discussion for the legislature to have, I would think, but certainly good for this, for this task force to discuss it as well. Um, I had a question, Ms. Volkis, related to uh, the bit about macular degeneration. If I remember that correctly, that was added after being after a petition process that was added by the Department of Health. Um, but then it turned out, as I recall, that the science wasn't as strong on that issue as it is for other issues. And there's actually no, if I remember, maybe just tell me if I'm remembering this correctly. First of all, there's actually no process set out in state law that allows uh, the Department of Health to remove qualifying conditions. Am I remembering that correctly? Yes, that's correct. Um, the authority given to the commissioner is to add the conditions through the petition process, but there was not an authority for her to remove the, uh, the condition. Um, and we did hear from uh, a handful of um, physicians that practice in that area and have AMD patients. Um, and uh, 
their feeling was, um, you know, they, they raised a number of things that um, I don't have the details right in front of me, but could share later if folks are interested in that. But that is what it, it was, is that um, it had to go to the legislature to be removed. Do you think it would be helpful? So sorry, sorry. Uh, do you think it would be helpful for the commissioner to have certain more, I mean, if I recall, we just passed a one-time removal, a one condition removal for macular degeneration. I mean, is it, would it be helpful? I mean, would it be helpful or desirable for, and I don't know the answer to this, for the department or the commissioner to have sort of more general authority to remove conditions or, or do you think it would be, it, it, or maybe on the other hand, it is better to leave that to a legislative decision? I don't yeah, I think, I think that the program was designed to have some check and balance, and that's why there's a gap between when the, the petition process is and um, when we add conditions, and then there's a, a gap during the legislative session and be, before um, the conditions are become effective. And um, so this process last year worked exactly how it was intended. Um, so, I mean, we'd be happy to discuss that, but I, I think that it, it worked okay last year. That makes sense. Uh, Senator Ralph. Yeah, I was just gonna chime in with what Chris said. I think that uh, we should we should be very cautious about trying to sidestep or so, uh, short circuit or go around the process that we've, I think, been pretty careful about establishing. Uh, and I'd wanna make sure that if we did that, we do it through a full legislative process with the hearings and, and, and not just kind of rush headlong into some changes. Um, it's, it's always possible to improve it, but I think we have to move fairly slowly when we, when we start tinkering with the process that appears to be working pretty well. Sure, I, I would agree with that. Um, any, I don't have any other, I don't see any other hands raised. Um, so maybe I'll just wait a minute just to make sure nobody else has any questions for Ms. Tholkis before moving to the next agenda item. Okay, I don't see any, so uh, the next agenda item is Darren Teske is going to be uh, giving an update on the annual petitions. Thank you, Chair Freiberg uh, and members of the, the task force. Yeah, the petition process relates to the adding of qualifying medical conditions and uh, delivery methods that we've just been talking about. Uh, the Office of Medical Cannabis established a process through administrative rule that allows members of the public to request an expansion of the list of qualifying medical conditions. Uh, for those of you interested, the rule is part 4770.4003. Uh, it's been in effect for about five years now. The petition window is open every June and July, and the requirements are pretty straightforward. Each petition is limited to a single medical condition, and if that medical condition has already been reviewed in a prior year, the petition must include new scientific support uh, that hasn't already been considered through the process. Uh, if a petition passes these threshold, threshold requirements, uh, the Office of Medical Cannabis collects all available evidence uh, concerning cannabis as a treatment for that medical condition. And the intent of this research group that we've then put together is to provide a comprehensive and objective review of the science of cannabis as a treatment for that condition for the decision maker. Uh, the Office of Medical Cannabis also collects written comments from members of the public. And then in the early fall, uh, the Office of Medical Cannabis convenes an independent seven member review panel to look at the evidence and to receive uh, additional public testimony from members of the public. Uh, this review panel produces a report by November 1st every year, which identifies potential benefits and potential harms from either adding or not adding medical condition to the list of qualifying conditions. Uh, that report is submitted to the Commissioner of Health, along with the petitions, the research briefs, and the written comments that we do receive. And the Commissioner makes her decision by December 1st every year. If the commissioner decides to expand the list of medical conditions by adding one, uh, she has to notify the legislature by January 15th. And then the legislature may, uh, by law, is the term used in the statute, block that addition, uh, which is what happened this year. Uh, 
And if the legislature allows for the new qualifying medical condition to become law, it becomes effective on that August 1st. Uh, there's a similar process for adding a new delivery method. Now, however, it does not go through the review panel, it goes directly to the commission. Uh, this task force may also have a role in the process. Uh, the medical cannabis statutes authorize, but do not require the task force to make recommendations directly to the legislature on whether to add or remove a qualifying medical condition. Uh, the task force may petition the Department of Health to add a delivery method or add or modify a uh, qualifying medical condition. And the task force may provide guidance to the Commissioner of Health in deciding whether to add a delivery method or add or modify a qualifying medical condition. Uh, this year, we're about halfway through the petition window. And to date, OMC has received two petitions from medical conditions and two petitions for delivery methods. Uh, they're still under preliminary review, but the conditions petitioned so far are for tick disorder and anxiety. Uh, delivery method can be a confusing term and the two petitions we've received so far this year for delivery methods are both to allow delivery through the US mail or similar method, uh, which will not meet the statutory definition of delivery. So it's been a quiet year compared to previous years. And uh, I think it, it, overall, I'm expecting it to be a little quieter than previous years. And with that, I'm available for any questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Teske. There's uh, Mary Kay Gilbert um, had a comment in the chat that was went back to the previous discussion. She just said she is in full support of advancing access through telemed. It has proven very valuable to support patient education, counseling, and harm reduction. Then there is a question from Charlie Reznikoff uh, to your presentation. He just asked, what was the first petition for? Your uh, sound broke up a little bit. Oh, it is tick disorder. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and Ms. Huckstra has a question. Um, you mentioned that this was a pretty quiet year. Um, have there been any barriers because of COVID to submitting requests? Yeah, Mr. Teske. Chair sure, Freiberg. Um, I think uh, there are, we've tried to reduce the barriers this year for the first time we're allowing online petition submission in order to facilitate petitions. Uh, I, I think it has, it's more a matter of the petition process just being ground out by, by COVID and other issues that are taking up more attention. Um, don't see a follow-up. So, uh, Mr. Reznikoff, you have a question. Yeah. Um, so question, a little bit of a question and a comment, the comment, and we talked about this in our last meeting way back when, after Alzheimer's was introduced. Um, well, I'll just say to begin, I think there are some providers who are on board as cannabis providers, and there are some providers who are very adamantly against it, and we're not going to change their mind. And then there's a big group of providers who are sort of agnostic and maybe I'll get around to that someday and I'm not dead set against being a medical cannabis provider, but I haven't gone through it yet. And so, and I think as a secondary th end point we should think about is how to help those agnostic people, providers, um, believe in our work and believe that we're doing good work and want to participate if it's appropriate. And so my point being that when the Alzheimer's was approved, many of my colleagues who are geriatricians were just sort of floored and blindsided and they just weren't aware that this process was happening. They didn't feel involved in the petition or approval process. And they said, wow, that really turns me off. And that, that just poisons the water. And I think we should be very careful to have our petition process and our approval process be as public and transparent and involving of the medical community as possible. Because what we get out of that is they become adopters if they are involved in the process. And I think a bad outcome is a, a committee makes a decision unbeknownst to people. It's, a, it's, it's out there technically in the public, but we're all busy, we don't know what's happening. And then one day we read it in the Star Tribune. And, and that would be a bad outcome for most providers 
Um, so my question is, how can we do this in a way that is as public and transparent and involving of the medical community and not those who are already believers, but those who are agnostic that we want to convert? How can we involve those in the petition process so when their approval happens, they're on board and they, and they, they approve of the process? Uh, Mr. Teske. Yes, thank you. Uh, thanks, Chair Freiberg. And thank you, Dr. Reznikoff, for the uh, comment and question. Uh, and I agree with you wholeheartedly that uh, the Office of Medical Cannabis can do a much better job uh, reaching out to the professional community. And uh, I think at the beginning of this process, um, beginning in 2015, the thought was that the office would remain neutral and let those come who uh, come and show an interest. Uh, that doesn't seem to have worked very well, to be honest. I think there have been a couple of cases where we would have been better served uh, actively reaching out to certain individuals, certain communities to ask for their input, ask for their participation in the process. And I think that's something that uh, we're looking into and uh, most likely will uh, do additional work in that direction. Do you have any follow-up, Dr. Reznikov? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I think I think there are many sort of um, open-minded, um, esteemed professional organizations in our community. I mean, we know Mayo has has been a, some you know a cha appropriate champion. I think the MMA has been supportive. Uh, the American College of Physicians has been supportive. Um, so reaching out to professional organizations and getting involvement from professional organizations in the community can really give a powerful stamp of approval. Um, and so when, we're, when the petition process is ongoing, say what is the relevant professional organization or expert from Mayo Clinic and kind of reach out and try to make that connection. And if you need any help, and I know there are other people that may be able to help, I'm happy to try to make those connections if it would make the approval land better when it happens. Thank you. Um, Ms. Stolkis, did you want to comment on this? Sure, thank you. Um, so I think that last year we um, began a process of reaching out and we've continued that this year to, uh, to the MMA and letting um, folks, they have a, I think it's a weekly or maybe it's bi-weekly, um, electronic newsletter, and we put an announcement that there is a petition process um, in place. And um, we also have a new addition of a communication staff person at the Office of Medical Cannabis. So I think that we, we are going to do a more thorough job of reaching out um, proactively to these professional associations. Um, I think that we certainly could use some help in identifying um, folks beyond MMA um, I think we know some of the usual suspects, but I don't think that we know all of the places that we should be reaching out to. So that would, that would be fantastic. And then the other thing that we can do is there's the proactive piece of letting folks know that we have the process and that we're open to accepting petitions. But then after we vet the petitions, if there are some viable petitions moving forward on particular conditions, we certainly could reach out to um, associations. Um, the Alzheimer's Association is a good example. Um, of an association related to a particular condition and uh, allow for folks uh, to at least be sure that they're aware there's a petition moving forward and give them the opportunity to upfront during the process, make comment um, in favor or in opposition of um, the petition moving forward. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Resnikov, did you have any follow-up? I saw you posted a comment in the chat room. Just wanna to volunteer to help and I appreciate, I appreciate the comments. Okay, um, any additional questions on this topic for uh, either Ms. Volkus or Mr. Teske? Let me just wait a minute to make sure there aren't any. Could that be an agenda item that um, each task member that has a medical background can provide some professional organizations that they think might be a good resource to reach out to? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's certainly fine with me. I mean, I imagine you could also just, I mean, uh, Ms. Volkus, uh, could they just provide it to you directly as well? Or what would be the best? I mean, is that something we should do in a task force meeting, do you think? Or it might be better just for one-on-one um, -on -one communication? One-on-one um, -on -one would be great since the petition for this year, for sure, because the petition process is open right now. 
And um, I know we're going to get to it later, but I don't know the frequency of future meetings yet. So if folks want to reach out directly right now, um, that would be great. Yeah. Feel free to also include uh, myself and Senator Relf on any communications you have too, if you feel it would be helpful. Um, it certainly would be for us, I'm sure, to get additional information. Okay, I don't have anybody else. Let me just double check the, I don't have any other questions. So uh, thank you for, the, for that discussion. Uh, the next item on our agenda is the uh, Minnesota Medical Cannabis Price Report. Um, who's, who would, I have a few people listed who would like to kind of take the lead on this one. So, Stephen Whitney or Yoko McCarthy or Barry Dunn. Um, hi, this is Steve Whitney with, with Barry Dunn. Um, Darren, would, would you um, present uh, our presentation or should I share it from my laptop or how? Uh, Steven, I just have the PDF. Yeah, I think it's, uh, Mr. Whitney, it looks like you've been made the co-host. So I think you now have the ability to share your screen if you have it on your laptop. Okay. I'm having trouble pulling it over from my screen, but there it is. You got it, Stephen? Or do you want me to share that? All right. Okay. So uh, are folks seeing the agenda? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, yeah, we conducted a, a, a medical cannabis price study, and um, today we're just going to do a brief introduction to who Barry Dunn is, uh, the scope of the study, the objectives of the study, and then discuss uh, four key observations that we had uh, related to the price study, comparison with uh, comparable states, sales data by category, and then uh, a quantification of the average 30-day supply of cost by qualifying condition. Um, I'll just go over the introductory things, and then when we get to the discussions of the key observations, I'll turn it over to Yoko. So just very briefly, Barry Dunn, we're, we're located in Portland, Maine. We've done a bunch of work in Minnesota, most notably, uh, all the participants in this study have, have worked with uh, MNSURE, the state's health benefit exchange, uh, working on uh, uh, pro program compliance reviews of, of the health exchange, where about 500 employees were a public accounting firm with a government consulting group. And we do a lot of cost analysis and cost accounting work, and that's how we got connected with the Office of Medical Cannabis. Um, the scope of the study was we reviewed costs from October 2016 through December 2019. Um, October 2016 was chosen because that was the first period which we could get really good cost data. Um, cost data prior to that was a little bit spotty. So the decision was made to use the cost data from October 2016 uh, forward through the end of December 2019. And we got cost data from both from the state, from the Office of uh, Medical Cannabis and from the two registered manufacturers, uh, Minnesota Medical Solutions, MinMed, and LeafLine Labs, LeafLine. So, the data we got was medical, medical cannabis sales data from the manufacturers, sales data from the Office of Medical Cannabis, um, and we used those two data sets to make sure that, that the data uh, was clean and, and we could identify issues and when there were discrepancies between the two data sets, we could review them with uh, the Office of Medical Cannabis and the manufacturers to make sure that we uh, got good clean data into the study. Um, we also got financial reports of costs that uh, producers in Colorado, Michigan, and Washington incurred um, from a, a, a financial reporting service called BizMiner. 
uh, and we selected medical cannabis product prices from sample dispensaries in Colorado, Michigan, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Washington. So we can compare those prices uh, in, in those states with the prices that uh, Minnesota consumers were, were paying. Um, there are four basic objectives for the study. The first was um, to document available medical cannabis products and the historical prices during the review period, October 2016 through December 2019, um, so that you could have in one place a, 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 an analysis of what prices consumers paid during that period. Um, to give a context of, of whether those prices in, in Minnesota were high or low, we compared the prices um, of sampled medical cannabis products in Colorado, Michigan, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Washington. Um, we also looked at sales data by category, documentation of discount programs offered during the review period, documentation of total number of units sold, sales, discounts applied, net sales from medical cannabis in each quarter during the review period. And finally, um, we calculated an average 30-day supply of the cost by qualifying condition that consumers paid um, during the, the study period. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Yoko and she can go through uh, the specific findings that the, the price study showed. All right, thank you, Stephen. Um, so the first objective was to document available medical cannabis products and historical prices during the uh, review period. For the readability of the report, we re uh, listed the price of cannabis products available as of December 2019 in the body of the report and listed the historical prices in um, Appendix A. Uh, we grouped the cannabis products into three types. Uh, THC dominant is a product that contained more THC than CBD. Uh, Leafline offered, um, as of December 2019, Leafline offered 10 THC dominant products and all 10 products contained more than 95% of THC. Mimed offered 23 THC dominant products and of the 23, four contained 83% of THC and another four contained 75% of THC. And the remaining 15 products uh, contained more than 95% of THC. And the second type is uh, THC equal CBD, is a product that contained the equal amount of THC and CBD. Uh, Leafline offered six products and MinMed offered 11. Uh, the third is CBD dominant, it's a product that contained more CBD than T, uh, THC. Leafline offered two CBD dominant products and both, both of them contained more than 95% of CBD. MinMed offered nine uh, CBD dominant products. And of the nine, one contained 83% of CBD and the other eight contained over 95% of CBD. Stephen, can you go to the next one? Thank you. Um, Stephen, sorry, can you yeah. move out? Yeah, Thank sorry. you. <laughs> All right, thanks. Um, so we further broke down these three products types into uh, four medicine types. Vape oil is a general term for cannabis concentrate in an oil form that is vaporized. Uh, this included uh, the products such as cartridges, syringe, and bulk oil. Um, and oral suspension is a general term for a cannabis concentrate that is consumed orally or sublingually. This type included um, products such as uh, oral solution, uh, sublingual, and tincture. And capsule uh, is uh, in pill form, and topical is um, the, the type of product that can be applied to your body surface, such as barm, bar, or lotion. Um, and these are, this table represents the number of uh, products that were available as of December 2019. And 
Um, vape oil um, is one in oral suspension, other uh, kind of popular type of products, and um, two of them alone uh, make up 70% of the, uh, the uh, product offering. And um, by the type of the medicine, THC dominant product uh, is, was uh, 54%. And THC equals CBD was 28%, and CBD dominant product uh, was 18% of the total 61 products. Um, one thing I would like to mention here is that the count of medicine is the count of unique medicine ID, which is also uh, called SKU. So when a manufacturer sells a single vapor oil per inch of 0.5 milliliter with one medicine um, ID. And uh, the same manufacturer sells the double pack of the same cartridge with another medicine ID. We counted those products separately as two products, although they are essentially the same product. Um, so, um, Stephen, can you go to the next one? Okay. So, our key observations here. Uh, uh, during the review period, LeafLine made two significant changes in their prices and products. In April 2017, uh, they uh, reduced the uh, price of all cannabis products by 23 to 26%. Um, in, in January 2019, um, they um, discontinued or consolidated some of the other cannabis products. So um, as of uh, April 2017, there were 35 unique medicine IDs available uh, or used. But in January 2018, that number was reduced to 18. So it's a pretty significant reduction of the, the products. Um, MinMed also had some price changes and product changes during the review period, um, but their changes were not as straightforward as uh, leaf lines. And um, so some of the cannabis product prices were reduced in the fourth quarter of 2016. And we also observed that they increased the number of products offered in the third and fourth quarter of 2017. That's when they, that's, that's when they introduced the uh, distill, uh, distillate uh, products. And then uh, during the fourth quarter of 2019, um, the prices of most medical cannabis products were reduced by 20 to 22%, with several exceptions. Um, prices were increased actually by 90 to 111% for six products. So that means that their prices actually uh, became almost double. Um, and the prices of two products were reduced by 33%. And MinMed uh, explained that uh, price change that um, uh, based on their financial analysis, it made uh, economic sense to sell certain products at a higher price. And main factors uh, considered were uh, cannabinoid content, uh, cost to produce, Custom, uh, customer demand and internal supplies, um, supply capabilities. Um, so this is the, uh, our first objective and observations. Do you have any questions so far? Looks like um, I don't see any question. So I'm gonna move on to the second objective. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so the second objective was to analyze and document the current prices as of March 2020 of sampled medical cannabis products in the six comparison states that are compatible to the cannabis products offered in Minnesota. And that six states included Colorado, Michigan, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Washington. Uh, so this table here shows the, the overview of the six comparison states. Um, it is, um, as the number shows, uh, Minnesota has the smallest market and the biggest is the Colorado, uh, which had 258 dispensary companies and uh, over 400 um, uh, distribution facility locations. 
And also in this um, table to the far right uh, shows if the state offer um, recreational market, a medical market, or both. Um, we, so for this study, we selected a minimum of five distribution facilities um, for each of six states and collected cannabis product prices uh, directly from their website. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, and we faced some challenges in this price research. Um, the biggest challenge was the, the limited availability of information. Um, we were only able to use the products as our sample when THC and or CBD content was clearly displayed on their website. So even if a, uh, this um, distribution facility had a THC dominant vape oil product, for example, um, if the THC content was not clearly displayed, uh, displayed on their website, we were not able to use it as a sample because we were not able to uh, calculate the number um, price of THC. Um, so we observed that THC and CBD content information was not consist uh, consistently available either, even on the same website. So for example, it may be um, the company might display the THC or CBD content for some products, but not for other products. Uh, so that was the biggest challenge to get the THC and CBD content information. And also, uh, none of the websites we reviewed uh, listed THC or CBD prices. So we needed to calculate the prices on our own. And this is how we did. Um, so THC, uh, for THC and CBD dominant products, we calculated the uh, uh, approximate price of THC or CBD by dividing the unit price by the amount of THC or CBD contained in the product. And in order to get more accurate uh, price, we only included the cannabis product that contained over 95% of THC or over 95% uh, of CBD for this study. Um, as a result, uh, eight medical cannabis products offered by MIMMED that I um, mentioned earlier that had less than 95% of THC or T CBD uh, were excluded from this study. Um, for the product that contained equal amount of T THC and CBD, um, we calculate the, uh, the price of cannabis, um, not the individual prices of THC and CBD by dividing the unit price by the amount of THC and CBD combined. Um, Leafline actually lists the price of THC on their website as uh, 19 cents, and CBD uh, price is between uh, 7 to 9 cents per 1 milligram. Uh, however, um, MIMMED does not disclose the prices of THC and CBD, uh, so we calculated um, this using the same method, method as I mentioned. Um, most Basically, the prices of THC were very similar uh, between Leafline and Min uh, MinMed for vape oil and oral, uh, sub um, but the capsule and topical uh, MinMed's THC price was seemed much higher than Leafline, about 38 cents per milligram uh, instead of 19 uh, cents per milligram. Um, and also another uh, challenge we uh, faced was limited sample sizes. None of the sampled distribution facilities offered all of the products types that Minnesota offers. Uh, so none of the um, this um, website had the price of vape oil, oral suspension, capsule, and topical. Um, so we needed to uh, review many different uh, websites to collect those number um, prices. Uh, as a result, um, the number of samples, uh, so, so the sample sizes are not the same for each product type. Um, so that was a challenge. And um, also 
Uh, the lowest, I uh, just wanted to note that lowest and highest prices that we mentioned uh, in our report are the highest and low lowest in our samples only. So um, they may not represent the lowest and highest prices for the state. Okay, and next slide, please. Our key observations from this uh, study was that Minnesota offers a medical cannabis product at comparable prices to equivalent product in the six comparison states. Uh, so their, um, their prices, uh, Minnesota prices were not outliers. They were pretty within the, the range with the other, other um, comparable pr um, products offered in the, the, uh, the other six states. Um, and the next, the second observation was that um, the other states offered a wider variety of product ca categories, such as flower, edible, and uh, additional types of topical. And all uh, six comparison states sell um, flower products. So that is the end of the second objective. Do you have any question? So, okay. uh, as long as you're stop asking, there is a question I believe from Aaron Chase. Okay, sure. Hey there. Um, yeah, just going back to when you were discussing the increase on prices, mm -hmm. you spoke to there being a decrease in demand and an increase in cost to produce. Can you speak a little bit more to that? Ms. McCarthy. Sure. Thank you. Um, so I believe you are uh, referring to the MIMED um, price change. I Correct. think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that was the um, uh, the explanation we received from Memed, um, because there uh, for Leafline it was straight like they they decrease uh, reduce the price of all cannabis product at the same time, but Memed had some you know reduction for some product and like a, a increase for some product and we asked uh, why. Uh, what was the base for that decision. And what we heard was that um, they do their own financial analysis and they do, uh, they believe that uh, it makes economic sense to sell certain products at a higher price. And um, when they consider the price change, the main factors that they considered are the uh, cannabinoid content of the product and cost to produce, uh, customer demand, and internal supply capabilities. Um, I'm not sure if I answered that question, your question, but those that's the information we received from the med. Ms. Chase? That works, thank you. Uh, Ms. Schroeder has a question. Thank you. Uh, Ms. McCarthy, how were Ohio, New York, and Pennsylvania chosen as the three medical only states to compare prices to? Ms. McCarthy. Um, sure. Um, so the, the states actually were, um, we determined these six states um, with the uh, collaboration with the team from the, uh, the Office of Medical um, Cannabis. Um, like I wonder if Chris um, or Darren, you have any um, input here or not? Uh, yeah, Chris or Darren, Ms. Ms. Volkus or Mr. Teske? Sure, so we tried to, um, to look at the makeup of each of the states um, what's permissible in each of those states, how their state uh, regulatory program is set up, and find some that were comparable. Um, some, some states that would have similar um, ch challenges, whether it's geography or weather or, um, you know, all of the, the, the things that go into a successful program. Um, and so we, we tried to just kind of go through um, the different programs and select some that we felt were comparable. Ms. Schroeder? Yeah, um, thank you. I just asked the question because I know New York and Pennsylvania were kind of modeled on Minnesota's model. Uh, so my organization had done a not 
quite as detailed pricing analysis. And when we looked at some of the other medical states, uh, specifically Arizona, Florida, Illinois, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Pennsylvania, our prices definitely look significantly higher than those other states. So I wanted to clarify and make sure that we got on the record that those three states and saying we're in line with them is, is not speaking to the patient needs um, of getting that price down. Thank, Thank you. you. I see. Thank you. Um, I'm just made aware of a question that came in. This is being broadcast on Facebook as well. Um, I've just been made aware of a question that was posted there. Um, th and it's, this is maybe a broader uh, policy question than, than this price report, but um, maybe Ms. Tholkas or Ms. Mr. Teske has a quick answer to this. When can we expect insurance to start covering cannabis products? I'm, I'm guessing maybe when it's federally legal might be the answer. Yeah, that's definitely not something that's within the control of our office, for sure. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions related to this. Uh, oh, uh, Mr. Resnikoff, uh, did you have a comment there? Well, I just wanted Dr. to... Oh, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I just or call me Charlie, really. Uh, I just wanted to respond to the question from Facebook being that there's sort of an alternative pathway of ca medical cannabis development through the FDA, which is very slow and cumbersome and it's a different whole style of products. But that is happening. In fact, FDA is fast tracking some cannabis products, aware that there's an all this the state based pathway is an alternative pathway. Um, those FDA approved cannabis products are um, eligible for insurance coverage. But as is already been said, this pathway, the state based products are not going to be eligible. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ms. McCarthy, would you like to continue? Thank you. Um, okay, so the third, um, our third objective was to document discount programs offered during the review period and um, document the total number of units sold, sales, discounts applied, and net sales from medical cannabis sales in each quarter during the review period. Um, so first, the discount, discount program. Uh, both manufacturers offered 15% uh, off the price of medical cannabis products for a recipient of a qualified medical assistance. Uh, the qualified medical assistance included uh, social security disabilities, uh, supplemental security income, Medicaid and medical assistance, uh, Minnesota Care, Indian Health Service, and Veterans Affairs Disability. Uh, in addition, LeafLine offered 15% off for military patients of active or veteran status. MinMed offered 50% off up to $100 for new customer and 15% off um, for military patients of active or veteran status and their spouse and children as of December 9, uh, 2019. Um, currently, MinMed, uh, website says that they offer 30% off on the first order and 20% off on the second order for new patients. So they may, might have changed the other deal program since December 2019. Um, and for loyalty program, LeafLine uh, offered and I think still do offer uh, uh, $1 worth of point for each net $20 spent on any purchase, including non-cannabis products. Um, and MinMed also offered some loyalty program during the other uh, review period, uh, but they made several changes in the program and uh, finally discontinued the program altogether by the end of 2019. Um, however, their patients can use the accumulated points uh, by the, uh, the end of 2020. Okay, the next um, slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so our key observation here was the sales of medical cannabis products continuously increased during the review period, uh, both in the number of units sold and revenue, as it shows in the graph here. Um, although uh, the number of units sold and net uh, sales moved in parallel for the most part, I would like to point out two things. 
Uh, first is the, the during the uh, first quarter of 2017 at the beginning, um, the net sales seemed to decrease a little bit uh, while the number of units sold remained the same. This might have uh, been caused by the price reduction by MinMed in the fourth quarter of 2016. And uh, the second change happened uh, to, uh, in the fourth quarter of 2017. Again, um, the growth of the other net sales was seen a little bit lower than growth of the other number of units sold, and that's when their line intersect. Um, this might have been caused by the price reduction by lead line in the second quarter of 2017. Um, and uh, also, I would like to mention that, um, that this um, pretty significant increase of the sales from 2016 to 2019 may have been caused by the, uh, the increase in the number of patients. Um, the, uh, the number of patients in 2016 was under uh, 3,000, um, but by 2019, there were uh, 21,000 patients, which was almost seven times more than compared to 2016. Um, so this is the, the observation from the third objective. Um, do you have any questions? Okay. And I'm gonna move on to the next uh, and the last objective. Okay. Uh, fourth objective was to calculate the average amount spent for the 30-day supply of medical cannabis by registered patient. We observed that on average, a patient spent 362 hours in 2016, uh, but by 2019, the average spent was decreased uh, to 316 hours, which is a $46 decrease uh, from 2016. Um, since we already established in the uh, previous slide that the sales of cannabis products con uh, consistently uh, increased from 2016 to 2019, we concluded that the decrease in the average 30 days spent we observe here was not caused by a decrease in the sales, but was likely caused by a decrease in the cannabis prices. Okay, next uh, slide, please. Okay. Um, this slide shows the number of patients by average 30 days spent by number of qualifying conditions. Uh, let me explain the number of qualifying conditions, yeah? Um, as a part of this study, we analyzed the sales data by qualifying conditions to see the relationship um, between the sales and conditions. Uh, we observe, observed that 85% of Minnesota patients were diagnosed and certified with one qualifying condition out of the 14 um, approved uh, qualifying conditions. And uh, which in this graph, uh, the red shows that um, the patient with uh, patients with the other one qualifying condition, which is about 85%. Um, the orange represents um, the patients with two qualifying conditions, which is about uh, 13, uh, 12%. And the uh, um, yellow is the patients with the other three uh, qualifying condition, uh, which is about 2.5%. And the patient with uh, four con uh, qualifying conditions and more uh, were about 0.5%. Uh, so this data shows that 73% of patients spend more than 100% and less than 300%, uh, sorry, more than $100 and less than $300 a month on average for medical cannabis in 2019. Okay, um, next one, thank you. And this is the last uh, slide that we have. But um, uh, so this, show, this graph shows this, um, this graph data only includes the patients with one qualifying condition. Um, and it shows that the red dots uh, shows the number of the patients, uh, which is the, uh, the number is to the right. Um, so IP uh, is the, the um, 
intractable uh, pain is the uh, the, uh, the largest group of um, condition um, that has about like over 10,000 patients. And um, the graph uh, with the, uh, the bar, a uh, blue bar shows the, uh, the 30 day average spent of the patients. Um, so 2019, the patients with the seizure had the highest average 30 day spent um, and patients with the terminal disease had the lowest. However, we wanted to note that the average 30 day spent of patients with terminal disease was much lower uh, in 2019 compared to the previous years. Uh, for example, uh, the average for 2018 was uh, $340, uh, $45, as opposed to $189. So the data may not represent the um, uh, typical year. Um, and uh, the patients with Alzheimer's disease uh, because this uh, qualifying condition was added most recently in August uh, 2019, we did not have a lot of data, and that may be why. Um, so that data here might not be sufficient to show the actual trend of the 30-day spend. Um, and so those are the key observations from this uh, objective. Do you have any questions? Um, yes, there are yes. a few. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, first, there was some reference in the chat, uh, just going back to that discussion about insurance. Mm -hmm. Mary Gilbert noted, as far as insurance coverage, regardless of federal scheduling, some insurers are taking real world evidence and using cost benefit analysis comparisons to validate reimbursement. I'm, I've mostly seen this for now in fully legal states or nationally in workers comp cases. Darren Teske says Minnesota Workers Comp has reimbursed medical cannabis costs on a case by case basis. Um, and then uh, Aaron Chase, I believe, has a question as well. Ms. Chase, are you able to unmute? Sorry about that. That's okay. uh, more of a comment than it is really a question, and maybe you can speak more to this. Um, I'm an analyst by trade and absolutely love data, so this is something I enjoyed looking at. Um, I don't know that we can reasonably conclude that the average spending is a direct result of price reduction, namely because it doesn't account for um, how much or the percentage of how much our patients are spending within the program. Mm -hmm. uh, do we know? I guess from MDH, the participation or dollars spent by our patients as a whole. Um, and then also kind of wondering if, you know, if there's more people participating, it's reasonable to assume that you would expect the prices to go lower because these companies should have more income to support their operations if there's more participation. And it's yeah, Ms. McCarthy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you. That's, you know, those are great points. Um, I can that answer if the um, if the demands go up, uh, the price goes down? That I think that is that I think it <laughs> makes sense, but um, that's probably the uh, the questions that uh, need to be answered by the manufacturers. Um, but um, sorry, the the first one that was just the comment, right? Sorry. Um, Ms. Chase, um, the, it was the, the first one um, you mentioned about um, the data of the price data, um, the, the sales data may not be representing um, the price reduction. Yeah, I don't that, know okay. if you can include that because sales sure. in, that the reduction in price is why that average spending goes down. I mean, mm -hmm. that doesn't necessarily take into account the, you know, is, is that because that's what they were prescribed? I mean, I, as a patient myself, um, mm -hmm. you know, if I were to take my recommended dosage, should be taking about six to $800 worth of medications a month. That isn't affordable for me. I spend maybe 250 to 300 a month on medications. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, that makes sense. Yes, um, I agree. Uh, we thought the uh, the price reduction may have been one of the contributor uh, because the um, 
we have seen the uh, the throughout the review period, um, most products um, prices were decreased by twenty percent or so. Um, however, as you you said, like I, I, I agree that there might be other contributing factors that we are not counting in here. Thank you uh, for pointing out. Thank you, uh, Senator Franson. Thank you. And my question is in line with uh, the pricing slide as well of, mm -hmm. of whether there's any correlation on pricing going down with any um, in, in the during the research. Have you found that uh, either manufacturer had new equipment or made any significant changes in um, solar panels or things like that that would have lowered mm -hmm. the cost? I was looking at it for more what they've changed in their process of inputs rather than um, just mere demand of the product going up. Do you mm -hmm. have any insight about that? Um, we actually did not collect that information of the factors that um, uh, for the price reduction, unfortunately. Uh, so I cannot uh, uh, answer that question, I'm sorry. But um, that makes sense though, like uh, yeah, uh, if the other operating, operating uh, costs decrease, I would think that and that will be reflected in the price. Um, so that makes sense. Yeah, and, and a follow up, it's not competition because we only have two manufacturers, so it can't be that. Mm -hmm, right. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Schroeder. So I have a couple connected questions that I think are properly directed to Mr. Teske and Ms. Folks. Um, I was wondering, do we have any data regarding how many patients are registered for civil protections versus registered to buy product? Um, I'm aware of patients that are registered that do not buy product uh, from the Minnesota market. And then connected to that, if we don't have that data, can we get a survey out to our patients to start collecting that sort of data? Um, you know. Are they buying less than what's recommended? Are they supplementing from the illicit market or another legal state? That's important information for us to have in protecting patients like me. Uh, any comments, Ms. Solkis or Mr. Yeah, um, I can say that I know that we, we have data on um, patient pur purchases. So if someone is registered for the, the program and has not made a purchase, um, we would know that. I don't think that we can say that that they are registered for civil protections. I think that there might be a variety of reasons that they didn't make a purchase. So I, I don't think that we could make that assumption. Um, but we, I, I think that we definitely know, and we have heard from pharmacists and from patients that um, that they pretty frequently. Um, are by doing exactly what um, Ms. Chase described, um, that they may be uh, prescribed from the, <clears throat> the um, pharmacist a certain amount and it might be out of their budget. And so they buy what they can um, or that they, they make a couple purchases during the month um, based on their, their budget availability. Um, so we, we do know that that's happening. Um, we don't have the, the direct data on that right now. It's more anecdotal. Ms. Schroeder? Okay. Uh, Ms. He Ms. Huckstra? Um, I was wondering if there was any price comparisons to recreational marijuana versus the medical costs, if there's a significant difference in that cost, like for example in Colorado where they have both medical marijuana and recreational marijuana available. I know some of our neighbors as well have um, just uh, legalize some recreational marijuana like Illinois. So I'm just wondering if their prices are significantly less or more um, on these um, pricing, if there's a comparison for that, if that has been something on anyone's radar when they've been pulling this information on this cost comparison. Uh, Ms. Stolkis, looks like you're... Sure. So, I mean, of, of course, we are aware that the cost of leaf is less than processed. Uh, there's, there's not as much of a processing cost associated with leaf product as there is to extracted products. Um, and we have lots of data on other states and their recreational programs and their, um, their medical programs on cost per pound and um, 
looking at cost per pound um, over time and uh, the variety of influences on why that price has fluctuated for different states like yeah. Oregon or um, uh, Colorado have longer histories than we do. Um, for the purposes of this particular study, you know, we had had many policy discussions at the legislature and um, just anecdotal stories out there about what the average cost per month is for patients. So we really wanted to just focus on our program as it currently stands and compare it to other programs that look similarly to ours to see if our current program was in line or way out of whack as far as um, pricing in comparison to other programs. I think that there is a lot more information that we could gather and analyze um, if we posed different questions. Um, so I, I think that um, we would be open to sort of gathering a list of possible future analysis. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. There was a question um, from Facebook. Did they factor in patient enrollment in these other states? Minnesota's enrollment remains low and it is incredibly restrictive. The more patients enrolled would drive down price. Um, I don't know if anyone has a response to that. Yep, that's absolutely true. I will say that we also, if you go on um, the Office of Medical Cannabis um, the, at the Minnesota Department of Health's website, you can see that while our number does uh, is low in comparison to other states, for our state, the, um, the number of registered patients continues to climb. It's absolutely got an, an, um, a, a curve that's going straight up. It just continues to add every every year, every month is, uh, uh, this. every month of this year compared to last year has gone up. Um, and we are adding, as you all know, we're adding chronic pain this year. Um, patients to start registering for the program under chronic pain on July 1st. Um, they can, uh, they'll be eligible to pick up product for the first time on August 1st. And I did check in with staff and so far in the first six days of patients being able to register, we've got 201 chronic pain patients registered um, in just that short time. So while there, there other states have much larger programs, we do know that Minnesota's program is continuing to grow um, month over month. Okay, thank you. Uh, any, Ms. McCarthy, were you um, pretty much done with your presentation? Yes, no? I, yep, yep, okay. I am done. Any additional yeah. questions for Ms. McCarthy or Mr. Whitney? Okay, I'm not seeing any, so thank you very much. Appreciate the presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yep, thank you. So the next item on our agenda uh, I have is a discussion of the impact assessment report. Um, and if, uh, as you recall, just from the, just from the opening presentation about the statutes, um, creating this task force, I think it says we're supposed to come out with one of these uh, every two years. Um, so I, I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on that or, um, I mean, some, seems to me like it's probably something we should do since the statute says we should. Um, I don't know if anyone has any thoughts about how, they, how they'd like to see it or what they envision going in there. Uh, Ms. Schroeder. Thank you. I will always talk when no one does. Um, to my recollection, it's been a long time since I've looked at the last impact assessment report. Uh, I would just like to make sure that we're making sure patients are heard in that um, and, and giving them a voice because a lot of the time when we're looking at government data, uh, we're not hearing from the patient. And I just want to make sure that that is taken into consideration because the greatest impact is on the patients. I think that's an excellent point. Um, and yeah, I think it's why it's important to have patient representation on this task force as well. Um, okay, well, um, maybe- just a, just a comment, I'm sorry if I, uh, I didn't get my hand up, but uh, do we have a format set forth? I was trying to look at the statute and is there a format set forth for this impact report? Uh, because I think that's something we should look, if there is, we need to look at that. 
uh, make sure we're complying with what the what the statute says. As I said, I I, I don't necessarily see something in the in the statute, but uh, I'm trying to recall the the last one that we did. If we actually did one, I don't recall that we did one in 2017. Yeah, um, I know. Just looking at the statute, there are certain uh, requirements as far as what's supposed to go in there. Um, it says it's including but not limited to program mm -hmm. design and implementation, the impact on the healthcare provider community, patient experiences, which gets to Ms. Schroeder's point, the impact on the incidence of substance abuse, access to and quality of medical cannabis, hemp, and medical cannabis products, the impact on law enforcement and prosecutions, public awareness and perception, and any unintended consequences. So. I mean, I think those are the, that's certainly the right of what's supposed to be in there. Um, Ms. Tholkis, do you, I mean, when was the, the has, has there only been one actual impact assessment done since the inception of this task force? Uh, you're muted. I would ask Mr. Teske to fact check for me. I've just been with the program for a year and a half. I believe there's only been one. Is that true, Darren? Mr. Teske. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, there was one done in February 2017, and that was actually the first and only report that the task force has produced. Yeah. And I'm not even aware if I was at that point. I know Senator Ingebrigtsen was on it before before I was, and he may have been on there when it was when that was done. Uh, is that report available, Mr. Teske? Uh, yes, Senator Ralph, the report is available to the Legislative Library and on the NBA website. I think it, it might be a good idea to get a copy of that and circulate it to the, to the members of the, of the task force just so we've got something to look at uh, and, then, and then possibly comment or try and uh, go forward with the process for creating a new report since we are bound by statute to have done that <laughs> it'd be a good idea i think that we comply yeah no i agree um yeah um mr teske if you could please send that around to task force members i think that would be helpful i, I mean and the the next item on the agenda is a discussion of future meetings because obviously i think if we were to produce one of these it would take uh, i think we'd want to have mm -hmm. at least a meeting or two so we could where we could just where task force members could weigh in on what goes into it i mean you know, my, my sort of tentative thinking, I, just to throw it out there, was that we might meet next in September. Um, I think when this when this task force was more active, I believe it was meeting every two or three months. Um, and with the, just with the rest of the summer in front of us, I think like starting up again in the fall seems like it might be a, a good approach. And also we have a special session of indeterminate length that's going to be starting next week as well. Um, so, I mean, I don't know if uh, I see Bruce has raised his hand. Did you have any comments on this? Uh, looking. Wait, oh, sorry. Uh, I have a comment, uh, not regard you know, before we stop about my comment is actually a question regarding the, what the status of replacing Tom Arneson is. Uh, Sure. Um, I mean, Ms. Dolkus, I see you kind of nodding. Sure. Um, so the state is in a hiring freeze right now. We had posted that position and um, received applicants and had lined up interviews. And then the state is in a hiring freeze um, due to the pandemic situation right now. So we're just sort of in a holding pattern for now. Um, one other thing, as long as I'm speaking, uh, just to let folks know, um, that there is a small budget for the task force. So as you think about the report, um, I think it's $24,000 um, that you could bring on, um, you know, we could contract with MAD or with another organization to facilitate uh, analysis for us um, in the absence of having a research manager at OMC directly. Um, so just to lay that on the table as an option for you all. Thank you. That's that's helpful to to know. Um, well, I mean, also during you know, I think you know, before our next meeting too, if any task force members have suggestions as to something they'd like to go in there or ideas as to who might be 
a good person to facilitate the process of preparing a assessment report to feel free to send any suggestions to Senator Ralph and myself. Um, I know we'd be very happy to hear from you at any point. Um, one, thing, one thing I'd kind of like to look at, I know there was some changes made to the taxing structure in terms of the uh, manufacturers. It would be interesting to see how that has impacted their costs if that, if that information is available. I mean, it's been a short stroke since it was done, but it, it, I believe there was some changes made in 2019 that may affect the, the, uh, the cost of production. And uh, that's something that it'd be interesting to see if there's been any correlation, correlating or any uh, concurring drop in price or, or not. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And I imagine, and there are some, you know, the price report we just heard about too, I imagine could be incorporated into the assessment report as well. Mm -hmm. um, so does, uh, does anybody have any thoughts about, does meeting in September seem reasonable to members? I'm seeing some nodding of heads, so, um, and thumbs up signs. So, um, okay, so I'll, I'll, we'll just, we can sort of tentatively plan on that. Um, I think there was a comment that a little more advanced notice would be helpful. We'll certainly try to, we'll try to do that. Hopefully we'll know what, hopefully we'll be done with special sessions by that point at least too, so it'll be easier to plan. Um, any, anyone have any additional comments or questions? Do the meetings have to occur during the day or could they happen after um, a typical work time? Oh, that, that's a fair point. I think, um, I certainly think they could happen after the, ha after the work time. So I think just as legislators, sometimes this is what we get kind of used to. So, but especially having volunteers, I think that's a, that's a good suggestion. So. Um, I'm, I'm certainly open to that and I'll, I'll check in with MDH's availability to facilitate it outside of office hours. Ms. Schroeder. Thank you. Um, I, I know it's not on our agenda for today, but I, it would be in, in line in our next agenda to have a discussion about adding additional delivery methods, including raw cannabis, which we've been trying to do at the legislature for the last two years, um, with, little to no movement uh, in, on the Senate side. So I would be curious to uh, have that conversation in the next meeting and maybe hear from Senators Ralph and Franzen as to how we can start looking at that and, and get that done. Because that Minnesota Medical Solutions has, has indicated that will drop price by 50% and we need to do that. Thank you. Yep, no, I, I'm certainly open to that discussion and Senator Ralph and I can talk about it in advance of the next mm -hmm. uh, Any additional comments or questions? It, well, thank you. I, th I think this has been a productive first meet, you know, first meeting in a while. Um, it's good to get to know people on, on the call and I'm looking forward to a reinvigorated uh, task force here. Senator Ralph, did you have any closing remarks as well? I think, uh, no, this is this is excellent. I do think that um, as we look forward to our next meeting, if we are going to talk about alternative delivery systems, I think we do need some, some better testimony or better information from the manufacturers as to the why they would feel that this would drop the cost of the product significantly, because I think that's important. This cost, in, in my mind, cost is the major barrier right now to expansion of the medical medical pro, uh, product uh, line and use. And I, and I do feel that there is definitely beneficial uh, impact of the use of, mer of medical cannabis. Uh, and I think that if we can find ways to expand it that don't open it up to some of the, the, the difficulties that we sometimes see in the states that do not regulate uh, it on a medical basis, uh, so I think that's important that we get that information so we so we understand the mechanics there. Yeah, I think that's that's a fair request. I think so. I think we should do that as well. Okay. Well, I guess uh, with that, just, I will. Yeah, uh, I was just going to say thank you all for your time. Uh, this is an important topic. I I'm on this board because I believe in what we're doing. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you all. I'm. Uh, glad to be a part of this as well. So I guess with that, uh, as co-chair, I can adjourn, the meeting's adjourned. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.